Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present part two of my series on the selected gross pathology of the cat, and we're going to talk about the hemolymphatic system. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who provided me their fantastic images over the years, and I hope that I do justice to them in this series of lectures. Here's our list of all the people who provided me images for this particular series on the pathology of the cat. Okay, I usually start out with the infectious diseases, um, and I like to start with the viral diseases. Here's a fantastic picture from Guillermo Rimoldi of the abdomen of a cat. And we can see that the abdomen is full of this honey-colored, uh, very thick, high-protein exudate. And there are fibrin plaques along the serosa of the intestine and probably the omentum as well. And I think I can maybe see some on the inside of the peritoneum. This is absolutely classic for uh, a condition known as feline infectious peritonitis. The morphologic diagnosis that I would put on this particular slide is something along the lines of exudative peritonitis with multifocal fibrinous serositis. Feline infectious peritonitis is caused by a mutated coronavirus. All cats have the feline enteric coronavirus, but in some individuals, and this is not really an infectious disease, but some individuals, the virus will acquire the ability to survive within macrophages. And if it does that, the body can't clear the virus, and over time it will continue to reproduce and reproduce and produce produce a tremendous amount of viral antigens. The body's response is to produce antibodies in response. And eventually, when you get enough antigens and antibodies together in the system, those antigen-antibody complexes are going to precipitate out of the blood into the wall of the nearest blood vessel, rendering it extremely leaky. And you will get a vasculitis. This in turn will call in additional inflammation, whether it's macrophages, lymphocytes, there's usually a lot of plasma cells because these animals are producing so much antibody. And you end up with a systemic vasculitis as seen here. These leaky vessels leak protein uh, into the exudate which goes into the abdomen, or it, they may be leaking fibrinogen which will polymerize on the surface of the vessels and the organs in which you find them. The macrophages in which the virus are producing uh, also increase their cytokine production, further promoting endothelial leakage. This particular picture shows me that the animal has good humoral immunity and is able to produce a lot of antibodies. The second form of FIP is the so-called dry form, which suggests that the animal has cell-mediated immunity but not humoral immunity. If the animal has both and they're working fine, uh, it can clear the infection. Just one more picture. Um, this is a liver from a cat, and you can see that it's absolutely covered with fiber. And this is what you might see in a cat with FIP. If you're able to take away the rest of the cat, just leave the liver there. This fiber has been preliminarized around the surface of the uh, uh, of the liver, if you looked at this, it would be a very thick mat of fibrin on top of the liver. When you see this much fibrin, you know there's a pretty profound vasculitis going on in the cat. Let's move on to a bacterial disease or series of diseases which are pretty characteristic in the cat. Whenever I see this pattern of miliary embolic necrosis in the spleen, these raised, white, variably sized, often coalescing abscesses, I think of a hot gram negative, especially Francisella tularensis, which this particular is. I don't think anything else really looks like this, except for the other really hot gram negatives, which are probably a bit less common, but something like Yersinia enrocolitica uh, or Yersinia pseudotuberculosis could do it. Supposedly, I guess Salmonella could do something like that, um, but it has to be a very hot gram negative. And the, all the gram negatives 
sort of work the same way. When they get into a susceptible uh, individual, they head straight for the uh, lymphoid tissue. The lesions are first seen in the ileum and they sort of wipe out the wall of the ileum and they burrow down. They cause these abscesses and burrow down where they hit the uh, portal bloodstream and that gets them into the liver. There's really nothing they're interested in the liver. It doesn't have any any uh, lymphoid tissue but they go ahead and destroy the liver while they're in there just for good measure. You'll also see uh, these little areas of necrosis or abscessation in the mesenteric lymph nodes and the spleen completes the triad of lymphoid tissue destruction. Then once you have destroyed all lymphoid tissue in that area you can go ahead and start destroying other things. So great picture of Francisella tularensis or tularemia, the hottest of the hot gram negatives. Okay, here is a great picture of a disease that is most often seen in immunosuppressed animals, but can be seen in immunocompetent animals as well. First thing that you're going to notice is this cat is very yellow or ictric. Second thing that you want to notice is the spleen is very large. And to me, this picture suggests a combination of intra and extravascular hemolysis. And one of the classic diseases that's often seen in uh, feed luke or other immunosuppressed cats is infection by the parasite Mycoplasma hemophilus or Mycoplasma hemominutus. Mycoplasma hemophilus can go after immunocompetent animals. Uh, they have to be uh, immunosuppressed for Mycoplasma hemominutus. This is usually transmitted by arthropods. And you have generally extravascular hemolysis, the attachment of this parasite and mycoplasma actually back in the day a long time ago used to be now when I talk a long time ago I'm probably talking millions of years ago but it used to be a gram positive organism but to adapt to a parasitic lifestyle it uh, shed a lot of the machinery including the ability to secrete a cell wall it used to be gram positive now it doesn't even have a cell wall so it's technically not even gram negative um, it also uh, lost the ability to uh, either produce or properly utilize amino acids, vitamins, and fatty acids. So it adapted very well to a totally parasitic lifestyle. When it uh, attaches to red blood cells, it does two things. One changes the, uh, the shape of the red blood cell. They become much more likely to pick up, be picked up by the spleen resulting in extravascular hemolysis. So it also sort of changes the osmotic fragility of those red blood cells. So in severe cases of parasitemia, um, you will also see intravascular hem hemolysis, which leads to icterus. You'll often see other uh, signs of, of this parasitism uh, in animals, including erythrocytic hyperplasia <clears throat> of the bone marrow, as well as lymphoid hyperplasia. They're not too difficult to pick up on routine blood smears. Um, PCR is extremely sensitive. Left untreated, about a third of the cats will be expected to die from the severe anemia. And if they recover, it usually takes a month before their hematocrits get back to normal, but they never ever really lose the parasite and they can serve as a reservoir for other animals in the area. Now you can't talk about cats and the hemolymphatic system without talking about lymphoma. Some people may have may put this up in the viral category, but I've dropped it down to the end of the lecture where I put all the neoplastic diseases. Because today, 80 to 90 percent of the cases of lymphoma that we see, the cats are feline leukemia virus or feline retrovirus negative. 30 years ago, before we started an extensive testing and vaccination program in the U.S., which is just now part of uh, other normal shots for a cat, the feline retrovirus was uh, just scattered throughout the population. And most of the, the lymphomas that we saw were FOCMA positive or positive for antigens of feline retrovirus. The vaccine seems to have taken all of those out. And those, unfortunately for pathologists, were the really interesting ones that you would see, you know, in all sorts of uh, 
uh, crazy organs. You would see them in the heart, in the skin, in the nervous system, in the kidney, wherever. And the clinical signs would just be referable to, uh, to where you see them. Today, most of the feline leukemias that we see um, are largely restricted to the alimentary system. They're often T cells, usually in older cats, uh, more than 10 years. Sometimes you get the large granular type, uh, which are interesting to look at because of the large granules within them that show up much better on cytology than they do on histology. The animals that had feline leukemia also had another wide range of diseases um, associated with immunosuppression. You had anemia due, due to bone marrow uh, involvement. There would be lesions in the mouth. And this was as a result of latent infections in most cases uh, in which the, uh, uh, the retrovirus was inserted cl too close or you know, during the normal uh, cycle of the cell cycle somehow was transferred too close to one of the uh, C-mic oncogenes and then the tumors would begin. These were usually seen in younger animals um, and they were much more likely to develop the mediastinal form which is pretty much gone by now or the multicentric forms which I've shown you before. Today we're pretty much restricted to alimentary, which you can see has moved into the local uh, lymph nodes. Most of your intestinal lymphomas are uh, uh, either T-cell epitheliotropes, so you will see them in the mucosa where they may masquerade and confuse you when you're trying to decide whether the animal has immune uh, enteritis, like lymphoplasmacytic enteritis. Or sometimes we'll still see uh, uh, B-cell tumors, which are the ones that may arise from the uh, pre-existing lymphoplasmacytic enteritis. So vaccine for feline leukemia has been great for cats, but not so good for pathologists. Now, most of the time when you see um, the spleens of cats with lymphoma, they're going to be large. Um, there'll be a diffuse enlargement. Um, this is a case uh, of lymphoma in a cat. Um, but the other thing that I think I would have, that would have to cross my mind as a differential would be severe hyperplasia of the splenic white pulp, one of the immunosuppressive diseases we haven't talked about um, while we're focusing on uh, feline uh, retrovirus, is feline lentivirus, the cause of agent of FIV. And like all lentiviruses, the first thing that it does when it encounters a susceptible host is to cause massive lymphoid hyperplasia, often resulting in profound expansion of the splenic white follicles or splenic lymphoid tissue to give itself a lot more targets. This is very common in animals or, any, or people with any of the lentiviruses, whether it's HIV, it's SIV, or it's BIV, where you get marked hyperplasia of the spleen and the lymph nodes initially to give the virus a lot of cells to infect, and then eventually when the infection is, is uh, rooted well, the whole thing crashes, the animals, uh, the, just the bottom falls out of the lymphoid numbers. Here's a great picture of a lumpy, bumpy, very enlarged liver and spleen. Hey, there's some, there's some wrinkles and folds in this spleen, even though it's uh, massively enlarged by a tumor. But uh, one thing that's pretty normal about cat spleens is the folds and the wrinkles. And they do a very interesting spleen, second to raccoons in uh, just the weirdness that you can encounter in the normal spleen. Now, when you think liver hepatomegaly, when you think splenomegaly, when you think of them together, I always want you to think about, especially in rodents, I want you to think about lymphoma. And I think when you see it in cats, I think you need to think about lymphoma number one. And if you told me that this was lymphoma, I'd be very happy. This one happened to be a mast cell tumor, another neoplasm that can be systemic and often will affect the intestine as well as the liver and the spleen. And when you biopsy these, they're just um, very bland, looking mast cells that have taken over. Some people call the condition 
uh, systemic mastocytosis and is often seen in the bone marrow as well. I just call this multicentric mast cell tumor, but you can do whatever you like. It doesn't bother me at all. If we look at a couple of other neoplasms of the hematolymphatic system while we uh, wrap up, this is one that I put in here not because it's a, we're looking at the lungs of this cat, the heart, and then a huge mass in front. And if you told me that this was lymphoma and you didn't have this picture here, that'd be just fine. Um, but another neoplasm that you can see in the thymus is a neoplasm which arises from the thymic epithelium, not the lymphoid tissue of the thymus. If you have a lymphoma that arises in the thymus, you can call it a thymic lymphoma. Okay, but if it's a neoplasm of the epithelial cells, then we call that a thymoma. These can be ridiculously difficult to get a good aspirate from, tend to be very cystic, very bloody, and you take 10 or 15 aspirates and you may or may not get anything to look at. Um, they can be a real pain for aspiration cytology, which is a shame because they're usually large and usually not too difficult to hit. Now, the, the uh, corroborating evidence that we're dealing with the thymoma here is the uh, the perineoplastic syndrome of an exfoliative, somewhat hyperkeratotic uh, dermatitis. You see this in cats. You can also see this in rabbits with thymoma as well. The dermatitis is sort of a dry. The skin is shiny. Um, the hair just sort of pulls out or epilates very easy. And there's often a light uh, crust over the top of this skin. It's thought to be uh, due to the generation of new aberrant populations of uh, CD4 cells uh, in conjunction with the, gross, the growth of the tumor. In the dermatitis, the head and the neck and the ears are affected first before the syndrome generalizes. It's not a very common neoplasm in cats. Ah, here's one. I showed you a spleen of the, the cat with Francisella tularensis, and if I saw this and you told me it was a domestic cat, I'd probably think of a hot gram negative. Now, um, if you told me it was a cheetah, um, then I'm going in a very different uh, very different way and cheetahs are a breed of large cats that have a lot of splenic tumors which are called myelolipomas they're exactly histologically what they are described to be in the name it's just aggregates of adipocytes not adipocytes don't say adipocytes that's wrong it's adipocytes and it drives me crazy um, but it's adipocytes throughout which are scattered uh, elements of blood marrow so you'll see immature erythrocytes immature white blood cells and occasional megakaryocytes. Um, little kitty cats, regular cats can have them as well. Um, they're not uncommon, they're just really a well-known neoplasm of cheetahs. You can also see myelolipomas in the liver as well. Usually about 50-50 fat cells versus uh, EMH. And we're going to wind this up with a great picture by Dr. Sarah Rosted, and it's just a hemangiosarcoma of the spleen of a cat. We don't see that with, with any of the regularity. It's a pretty rare thing in cats, certainly not like dogs, where the spleen is a major spot for the production of these tumors. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the lymphatic system. I could have started with, uh, uh, with lymphoma and just gone on about lymphoma, lymphoma, lymphoma. Um, but it tends to get very rep uh, repetitious these days because we don't see the variety that we used to back in the day. Well, thanks for spending the last 20 minutes with me. I hope you come back from other, for other lectures in this series or in other series. And as always, I wish you wonderful health and a fantastic day.